So good morning, everybody. And um, today we continue our discussion about the green solution theory. And yesterday we had the first uh, introduction about the, the green, green function itself. Do you have any question about what we discussed yesterday? Did you have any night thoughts, any dreams about the main body physics? Everything fine? Okay, so this is the point where we arrived yesterday. We derived an equation uh, for the Green's function and we introduced this uh, self energy that is a uh, non local, complex, and frequency dependent operator. So it's an effective uh, potential, generalized effective potential that takes into account all these change correlation effects beyond the heart rate uh, approximation for the calculation of the Green's function. So it plays the same role of this general potential of uh, conscious density functional theory, but for the calculation of the Green's function. That's why it's a more complex object, because the quantity we are interested in, namely the one particle Green's function, is a more complex object than the uh, density. And uh, this is an exact equation in principle. So if you are able to solve this equation, we are able to calculate exactly the single part of this function. And in principle, just the single part of this function. If you are interested in the two part of this function, you have to come back tomorrow and listen to Francesco, okay, for example. And someone is interested in three particle excitations. Again, these are uh, kind of excitations are not explicitly described by the Green's function itself. All the mini body, uh, uh, many particle excitations are encoded in this frequency dependence of the uh, self energy. Yeah. It's a self consistent uh, problem in the sense that the self energy itself is a function of the Green's function. Indeed, the GW approximation is uh, the name of an approximation for the self energy in terms of the Green's function, G and W. <laughs> Yesterday we have uh, discussed about G and you already realized that we are uh, half the way to the GW approximation. Now, today we have to discuss about W. Okay. And uh, any approximation to the self energy is an approximation to the Green's function. And yesterday we have discussed why it's an advantage to uh, approximate directly, uh, well, to approximate the self energy instead of approximating directly the green function. This is uh, uh, an equation for the uh, green function, where we have an expansion in terms of the self energy in this Dyson form, but it's not the only possible expansion for the green function. Other uh, expansions are possible. For instance, it's possible to derive an exponential uh, representation of the green function that it's uh, called the cumulant expansion, where you have uh, the uh, exponent of this exponential, that is the cumulant that one has to approximate. So different kind of uh, um, expansions for the Green's functions are possible. Uh, in this week, we don't have time to discuss other possibilities, so we will focus just on the Dyson equation and on the GW approximation, okay? So today, GW approximation. No questions, everything fine? Okay, so we have to go back to the physics. So far, uh, most, of the, most of the discussion was about mathematics and the strategy to calculate the quantities that we want to calculate, right? Uh, now we are talking, we are going to talk about the uh, physical uh, content of the approximation that we want to make. So we have to go back to the physical process we want to describe. And the physical process that we want to describe is uh, for the mission. You remember yesterday we started our discussion from, uh, from for the mission itself. And in particular, here we take the example of direct for the mission. 
in which we have a direct uh, photon that is uh, used to uh, remove one electron from the system. So here we have uh, a pictorial representation of our many electron system. Each electron is a red uh, circle. And uh, one electron is photo emitted. So this electron leaves the, the sample. And uh, we have the creation of a positive charge that is called the photo hole. It's the uh, hole that the photo emitted electron uh, is leaving behind. Now, the photo emission experiment itself is pretty complicated. And uh, here I've listed some uh, of the aspects that we are not going to discuss that are related to the photo emission experiment itself. But it's important uh, already to be aware about this uh, reality aspects. Um, because here you have a series of uh, photo emission spectra for the same material. It's uh, V2O3. So the material is always the same. What is changing from one curve to the other is the energy of the photon. Sorry, this way. So this energy. And you see that the spectra are completely different. So the spectra are in particular dependent on the photon energy. And uh, you see that the removal energies are more or less the same. In principle, they should be the same, but the shape of the spectrum is completely different. And this is this has nothing to do with the Green's function. The Green's function or the spectral function is not photon energy dependent. It has to do with all these uh, aspects uh, that related to the interaction of light with the matter and the photo electron uh, process itself. We are not going to discuss about this. But please keep aware of the fact that when you compare your calculations with an experiment, there is always a gap between what you calculate and what you measure. And when you compare with the experiment, you have to be very careful. You have to know what you are doing. The best thing is to work together with the experimentalist, because in this way, you can bridge this gap much more easily. OK. OK, so we will neglect many things and we will just ask the question what happens if you create a positive charge in a system of electrons okay so we will neglect all the interaction of light with matter we will simply ask the question what happens if you create a positive charge that is in our case the photo hole in the case of inverse photomission that would be in the process where you add one electron to the system, you can understand that it's a symmetric question. So we will focus just on this process where we create a positive charge. Okay, this is the question we want to answer, we want to address today. What happens if we create a positive charge in a system of electrons? So if the electrons are non interacting, first uh, situation, what do you think is going to happen? I create a positive charge, but the, the electrons are non-interacting. What happens? Hmm? Nothing. Nothing. Yes, I agree. Nothing. Okay. The electron, all the other electrons are not feeling the presence of a positive charge because there is no Coulomb interaction. Okay. So you can do whatever you want. You create a positive uh, uh, charge. You can, uh, I don't know, <laughs> extract another charge. The electrons are going to stay there forever, OK? Because there is no electron-electron interaction. This is pretty boring, OK? Luckily, there is the, the Coulomb interaction, and life is much more fun. So the corresponding spectral <laughs> function in the case there is no interaction. It's just, and this we have discussed already yesterday, it's just a delta peak centered at the energy of the single particle level that the electrons was occupying before being emitted. Okay. Nothing is happening, so the lifetime is infinite, and indeed the width of the peak is zero. 
the width of the peak is the inverse of the lifetime of the excitation that is created inside the material. Okay. Do you like it? Not so much. Why? I was wondering that when uh, you said that they are non interacting particles mm -hmm. by the anol, then uh, I would expect some sort of rearrangement. Uh, for example, if I leave mm -hmm. uh, state which is degenerated to the Tefal exclusion principle, then if there is no anymore an electron, well, the whole and not in the same brown state. Mm -hmm. And then okay. I would expect let's imagine to... that we are all blind in this room and it's dark. And uh, we cannot hear what is going on. So no interaction at all. You leave the room. Do we realize that you leave, that you leave the room? Mm. It's a question. Mm, probably not. <laughs> no. So you see that we are in the same situation as non interacting electrons. Mm. Okay. okay. So we don't like it. I agree with you because it's boring. We like interactions, right? And indeed, if the electrons are interacting, what do we expect that uh, is going to happen? Uh, yes, uh, you can repeat what you just said. Well, first of all, there is the rearrangement like it. of the ground state, and then probably there is also the effect. Well, I already know the answer, maybe, but the effect of the screening uh, due to the other electrons. So, what is screening? I, I don't know this word. Okay, so uh, the way that I see it, like, um, it's a combination of all the interaction uh, between uh, uh, the electron and all the other electrons that are there. So, for example, if I imagine that as a multiple scattering event, the screen would have to take into account that. It's very complicated. Yeah. Okay. Be simple. Something simpler. If I create the positive charge and I have all the negative charges around, what's going to happen? There is the cloud. No, there is the Coulomb interaction, right, between the electrons because the electrons are interacting through the Coulomb interaction. So there will be an attraction between the positive charge and the negative charge, and there will be a repulsion between the negative charges. So something like this: the uh, electrons will move to screen the positive charge. In the sense that the electrons will react from the presence. <laughs> ah, by the way, you can see what I see. No, because there are uh, holes here in the sense that. The, the background should be blue, and I don't see it. Ah, uh, yeah, we see it only. Oh, in, in the screen, we see it a little bit, and now uh, with the projector, we don't see it at all, maybe with the light switch stuff. Just for a second. Mm, not really. Oh, it's the projector uh, quality. Okay, that sorry. Okay, yeah. that's not good, but um, okay, you see that the electrons are moving and they are reacting for the presence of this positive charge, okay? This is called uh, a polarization, okay? And what is uh, uh, this polarization, this reaction for the presence of a, a positive charge? Okay, you don't see it, but for each uh, electron that is moved, you can imagine that this electron that has been uh, displaced from the place it was uh, occupying, as uh, this electron has created a, a hole at the, in the position it was occupying before. Okay, the electrons is moving. It means that this electron gets excited. So an electron that is getting excited in the band structure diagram it means that it makes an electron hole excitation. Okay, it means this means that what we are uh, describing is is a polarization made of the creation of electron uh, charges, electron pairs. So the effect of the presence of uh, a positive charge is the reaction of all the other electrons. The other electrons gets, uh, get excited. 
they create a letter node pairs because they get displaced from the position that they were occupying. All this is called polarization. Okay. Okay. Very good. So you don't see it, but we can identify three kinds of particles in our system. The original photohole, the electron, and the hole that is electron has left behind. And the same, of course, for all the other electron hole pairs that you can imagine with your fantasy. Okay, so in principle, we should describe the interaction of the photohole with the other hole, of the photohole with the electron, and uh, uh, of the electron of the electron with the hole that is uh, uh, left behind. And this should be done for all the possible uh, electrons and holes that have been created here. This is clearly a many body uh, process, very complicated to take into account. And this is in itself uh, the many body effect that we want to create, we want to describe. Yes. Can you please repeat this question? Yes. Yeah. I'm so I'm very sorry that you cannot see it. But we what we said is that this uh, uh, reaction of the electrons for the presence of the hole or the photo hole can be understood as the creation of electron hole pairs. Why? Because the electrons get excited, so they move to a different place, which means that they uh, are going in the band structure picture to an exact uh, level. So we have uh, the creation of uh, electron hole pair. If you maybe if you go back and forth continuously, we will see that uh, there will be. Yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> you will have a look at the PDF later and you will see. Okay. So we see, we can, we will see uh, when you have the PDF that we have three kinds of particles to describe and their interactions. We have the original photo hole and the electron and the hole of each pair of electron hole pairs that we have created. And we have many pairs, of course, of electron and holes. And so we have all the possible interactions between this uh, photo hole and these electron hole pairs and among all the pairs that we have to, in principle, take into account all the possible pool of interactions. And this is a many body problem, okay? And it's in principle very complicated. And this is the moment where we have to make a choice. This is something that it's too complicated. In principle, this is still the many body problem. And now it comes the moment that we have to make a choice and we have to decide which is the most important physical process we want to describe. And this is what the GW approximation does. So we say that the most important physical process that we want to describe is this screening, which is this reaction of the electrons for the presence of this positive charge in terms of this uh, polarization. And what we do is that we replace all these uh, electrons in the system by a simply a density, an electron density. So we forget about the fact that we, are, we have single particles in the system. And we just consider the change of the density for the perturbation that is due to the presence of the positive charge. So if you like, it's a sort of mean field treatment of the uh, effect that we want to describe that is screening. Okay, we describe this polarization effect just in terms of the variation of the density for the presence of an external potential. And this is something you are already familiar with because this is indeed what we do in TDFT. In TDFT, we have a response function uh, that is the variation of the density for the presence of an external perturbation. Okay, here we are at the same level we describe this polarization just in terms of the variation of the density, not in terms of uh, uh, interactions between all the particles. But the important thing is that we take into account screening 
polarization reaction of the electrons in an approximate way. This is just the GW approximation. Okay. In practice, what we do is that we in, introduce a screen Coulomb interaction W, and the screen Coulomb interaction W replaces the pair Coulomb interaction V. The difference between W and V is the inverse the electric function that you have already uh, calculated or look at when we have uh, calculated uh, the loss function or you have looked at the spectra of the loss function. Indeed, the loss function is minus the imaginary part of uh, epsilon minus one. Okay. And you have seen that this loss function is characterized by peaks that are, uh, for instance, plasma excitations that are the collective charge oscillations in, inside the material. So all these possible electronal excitations, uh, they can be interband transitions or plasmons. These uh, charge excitations are those that are entering, that are characterizing the inverse electric function. And this inverse electric function acts to screen the Coulomb interaction and to produce a screen Coulomb interaction W. So the GW approximation is an approximation for the center energy that it, uh, is just the product between the Green's function G and the screen Coulomb interaction W. The difference between W and V again is given by the inverse electric function. So if we are in vacuum, W uh, as an expression that is familiar. If you, if you are in a system that is completely in vacuum, no electrons, what do you expect that W is? Imagine that the room is empty. Is there any possible uh, screening? Any possible reaction of people that are not here? Only the vacuum. Hmm? Only the vacuum can. Yeah, but since for us there is no action of the vacuum, <laughs> there is no screening. Okay. Vacuum, I mean, really a system where uh, there is nothing, not vacuum in the quantum mechanical sense. Okay. So this uh, dielectric function is a, a property of the material we want to uh, describe. If we are in vacuum, W is just the Coulomb interaction, the pair Coulomb interaction. In general, W is weaker than V because the dielectric function is larger than one in normal situations. So epsilon minus one is smaller than one because epsilon is larger than one. Okay. So, and this is the, the general situation. Yeah. Could you expand a bit on why the definition of the screen is such? Why the integral in the space of this product? Okay, why you have an integral is just because you have uh, functions that depend on two points. So you want to have an interaction that is also two points, it's an interaction. So this makes sense. Uh, otherwise, it's just a matter of uh, definition. Okay, this is how we define the, the skin column interaction. I think that the important point to notice is the fact that this interaction now is frequency dependent, while the Coulomb interaction is not frequency dependent, right? Do you remember the form of the Coulomb interaction? Yes. Hmm? Yes, sir, or, or no? R1, R2 equal to? One divide the distance R1 minus R2. The distance between R1 and R2. Okay. And this is not frequency dependent. Instead, the screening is frequency dependent. And this we can understand because we can understand that uh, imagine that the electrons are moving very fast. Well, they don't have the other electrons don't have time to screen these electrons. Okay. Instead. A static screening is in general stronger. Static means omega equals zero. 
because we have the time to think about the fact that this, this polarization charge that has to build up. And so we see all the possible screening effects. And this is why this screening is frequency dependent. Otherwise, you know that this is frequency dependent because you have calculated it. So you know that there are particular resonances like plasmons where the uh, it's, there are frequencies that the system of electrons like very much because these are the resonances that correspond to the collective charge excitation of the system of the material. Okay. So this function has uh, peaks. Uh, the imaginary part of this function has peaks corresponding to these uh, particular uh, resonances of, uh, of the material. Okay. Yes. Uh, how do you define frequency in this material? Hmm? What is the definition of frequency? The definition of frequency is the energy of the, the ex yeah, it's the energy of the possible excitations, charge excitations that we have in any material. So you calculated the silicon, I think, no, on uh, Tuesday, and you calculated the absorption spectrum that is related to the imaginary part of epsilon. And I guess that you also calculated the loss function. And the loss function is the imaginary minus the imaginary part of epsilon minus one. And you did so for Q equals zero. Okay, we are in the reciprocal space. Instead, here we are in the real space, but we are just talking about frequency. And you have seen that this is a frequency dependent function, right? And this frequency is related to the excitation energy of the charge excitations in the material. In the case of silicon, it's at Q equals zero, it's just uh, a potato, the spectrum, that is centered at uh, 16.7.8 electron volt, which is the plasmon energy of silicon, okay? Which is the characteristic uh, charge excitation of silicon. In other materials, this uh, loss function would have a different form, okay? But the important thing is that W is screened by the possible charge excitations in the material. But actually, <clears throat> that frequency wouldn't be the frequency of the external laser field with whom you are exciting the electron? No, because we said that we... Because what I'm assuming is that the electron is taken off from the material with some laser field. Um, it's stuck. No, because we said that we forget about the interaction between the uh, photon and the material. Yeah, yeah, kill it, kill it and stuff. Right. This was the slide where I was showing the different spectra according to the photo energy. And we said that we simply forget all this. And we just answer to the question, what happens if I create a charge inside the material? And this doesn't depend on the photo energy. Yeah, but to extract an electron, you need a energy field. You need uh, a radiation and... Uh, so even if we are not considering that process, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand your point. And if I able, I show you. I don't know. It doesn't like for the mission. Do so. you have it in the key? I have it in the key. Yeah, but I have the key. I have to look for the key. <laughs> okay. Uh, I can draw the spectra, but I'm not very good in drawing the spectra. But you remember that the spectra were very different according to the photon energy. Right. And the photon energy was uh, in the range between. Uh, uh, some tens of electron volt to some few electron volt. Mm -hmm. And this is possible because uh, uh, 
because we use uh, uh, synchrotron radiation. Uh, I just uh, don't find it. No, why they are not. sort of a mess of a Fino a ieri volevo rifarlo, ma io da oggi poi no. It's because I'm talking too much. Sì, questo è quello che abbiamo fatto. Ok. Allora, okay. okay. Defect is that the shape is completely different. Okay. But we are always looking at the same uh, energy in the valence bus structure. Okay. It means that here we are creating a hole that has a binding energy of two electron volt, always the same binding energy. What is different if we change the photon energy in this process is the energy of the photo emitted electron. Okay, so imagine that you come with the, with the photon that has a six kilo electron volt. It means that the photo emitted electron has more or less six kilo electron volt energy, kinetic energy. Okay, because I have created a hole that has two electron volt binding energy. If I come with the photon that has 19 electron volt, the energy of the emitted electron will be around uh, 15, 17 electron volt, depending on the work function. Okay, this is the main effect of the photon energy. And then uh, there is all these uh, effects that we don't take into account. Okay, but what we are discussing here is just the fact that we have created we have created this photo hole, and this photo hole. Uh, is just uh, our um, uh, perturbation inside the system of electrons. Okay. And the frequencies we are talking about are the frequencies of the oscillations of these electrons for the presence of this positive charge. And in particular, these uh, oscillations will be 
the energies of the electronal transitions, the plasmons in the material, okay? And all this doesn't depend on the photon energy. Indeed, when we calculate a spectral function, that is the imaginary part of the Green's function, this is not dependent on the photon energy. The Green's function doesn't know anything about the photons. It just knows uh, about the electronic excit excitations in the material. <clears throat> okay. Okay, so we have introduced a modified Coulomb interaction that is screen, and in general, it's weaker than the uh, bare Coulomb interaction. And the other uh, quantity that uh, the other concept that we are going to introduce is the concept of quasi particle. And the quasi particle will be defined as a bare particle, it can be a bare electron or a bare, bare hole, plus the polarization cloud, the screening cloud that is created around the electron, which means that we are partially taking into account the fact that the other electrons are feeling the presence of this hole. So the Electrons are interacting through the bare Coulomb interaction. The quasi particles are uh, composite uh, particles, where we already take into account partially these effects of the Coulomb interaction. And they will be interacting through the screened Coulomb interaction that is weaker. Okay. More mathematically, we now can compare the uh, spectral function for the situation where the electrons are non-interacting, that was just a delta function, with this more general situation of the electrons that are interacting. And you see that the spectral function in this situation is much more funny. And it's not as boring as the non-interacting picture. You see that there is a prominent peak plus some other structures. The prominent peak is indeed the quasi-particle excitation. And we can still make an association of this prominent peak with the single particle uh, excitations. In the sense that the, the energy is changed, the width is large, it's larger now, and the width is large because this excitation has a finite lifetime. It's not going to, um, going to stay there forever. And uh, still we can, in the spectral function, we can see that there is a prominent uh, feature, okay? And we can think that this is a renormalized single particle excitation. And we call it the quasi particle, okay? And this is typically in materials we are interested in uh, taking something like 70% of the integral of the entire spectral function. The stronger correlation effects are, the smaller the intensity of this uh, quasi-particle excitation is in a material. This makes sense. Strong correlation means that we cannot anymore uh, describe the material, the excitations in the material as renormalized single particle excitations, which is what we have in this quasi particle picture. Okay, this means that in a strong correlation situation, we have many particle excitations that are the dominant ones. For uh, materials we are interested in, in here, and you will calculate like silicon. Again, this quasi particle excitation will take 70% of the entire uh, possible excitations. But in general, we can have also a weight that goes to zero. Okay, it's possible in what we call, for instance, a mot insulator. Then we see that there is another feature that is called a satellite. In the uh, description of uh, the excitations that we are making through the GW approximation, we can understand this satellite as, uh, as the fact, 
as the consequence of the fact that we are creating a positive charge in the material. And this positive charge in the material can induce additional excitations in the material, for instance, plasmons. And it means that in this situation, oh no, in this situation, we have an electron that has left the material. We have uh, a hole that has been created. This hole has induced an additional excitation and the material, the system of electrons is in a state N minus one because we have removed one electron, but it's not the ground state. It's an excited state of this N minus one electron system. In this excited state, we have removed one electron and we have also created an additional excitation, for instance, a plasmon in the material. And uh, this is a pure effect of Coulomb interaction, a pure effect of correlation that goes beyond a single particle picture. Okay, and this is encoded in the spectral function. Okay, so what is the GW approximation? In the GW approximation, the most important thing is that we take into account the fact that we have created an additional charge and that we deal with this additional charge in the electronic system. And we have to describe the reaction of all the other particles for the presence of this positive charge. And this reaction is in terms of the polarization of the electrons. Uh, and it's, it goes into the name of screening. And it's, this screening is through electronal uh, charge excitations that have been created. OK, so this is what we consider as the important physical uh, process in the material. And in the GW approximation, we make approximations. It's an approximation, okay? So it's not exact. And the two most important approximations that we make in the GW approximation are the following. First, we consider the fact that the polarization that we are uh, going to take into account is made of non-interacting electronal pairs. And this is the random phase approximations that you have already studied in TDFT. It means that yes, I'm taking into account the fact that I'm creating electronal pairs, but there is no interaction in the GW approximation between the hole and the electron of each electronal pairs. Of course, this is an approximation because this electron and this hole, for example, have different charge. So in principle, they would attract each other. In the GW approximation, we neglect this electronal attraction. So we stay at the level of the random phase approximation for the calculation of the polarization, which means that we use the random phase approximation to calculate the screening. It means that, for instance, we take into account plasmons, but we don't take into account excitons in GW. The second approximation is that we take into account the interaction between the additional charge and the polarization due to all the other uh, electrons at the classical level, at the heart level. We just take into account the variation of the potentials at the heart level. You have already seen that um, when you have a, an external perturbation, the charge is changing, so the internal potentials are changing. And you have seen this in linear response, right? The effect of a perturbation is always a change of the potentials inside the, the electronic system. What I'm, uh, and this is a correlation effect, okay? What I'm uh, telling you is that in the GW approximation, we just take into account the variation of the RT potential. We don't take into account the variation of the exchange correlation potential that would be the self energy, okay? So we take a, a classical picture of the interaction between the additional charge and the polarization charge that has been created. And this corresponds to this step that we have made here between this, uh, uh, description in terms of interactions between single uh, particles and this 
description in terms of change of just the uh, average electron density in the material. We forget that we have individual uh, electrons here, and we just take into account the fact that we have the classical charge that is changing. So for instance, we neglect the variation in this variation of the potential, we neglect the exchange effects, okay? We know that the electrons are fermions. So if the charge is changing, we should also take into account the fact that, and this is electrostatics, and this is the effect that we are taking into account in heart rate. We should also take into account the fact that there is also a change in the exchange potential. And this is not uh, taken into account at the level of the GW approximation. Okay? We take into account this change interaction, but we don't take into account the variation of this change interaction. Okay, is this clear? Okay, very good. So <clears throat> there was no time to derive the uh, set of equations that uh, goes under, of, under the name of Edin's equations that are a set of five equations in five unknowns, which is an elegant way that uh, was uh, derived by Edin and others before him. And the important reference is here. Uh, to summarize all the uh, most important uh, physical uh, variables and their uh, equations um, that we have in equation theory. This is in principle exact. And uh, in principle, it's a closed set of equations. You have five equations in five unknowns. And we can go through them just to list them and to know uh, what we are talking about. So the self-energy you already know, okay? It's this effective potential uh, that is frequency dependent, uh, com uh, complex and non-local that we use to calculate the Green's function. Don't forget that we want always to calculate the Green's function. Then we have the polarization and the polarization, uh, I think this you have not seen when um, you have studied TDFT. Um, in TDFT, you have uh, uh, seen that there is a response function chi that is in this jargon of many body perturbation theory. It's called uh, uh, the reducible response function. And uh, chi and p, that is the irreducible response function, are uh, cousins, let's say. So the two are related by uh, a simple expression, okay? So this is called uh, irreducible. This is called reducible because this is related to the terminology of Feynman diagrams. But let's say that P and chi contains, uh, contain a very similar uh, physics, the physics of the polarization. And indeed, you see that we use P to calculate W, that is the Coulomb scaling interaction. In this set of equations, oops. In this set of equations, <clears throat> there is also this function gamma that is called the vertex function. And in the GW approximation, we set the gamma, the vertex equal to the first term, and we neglect this second term which means that in GW approximation, we have GW for the self-energy and GG for the polarization. So this, this uh, GW approximation is indeed what we want to, to have, the GW approximation for the self-energy and the polarization becomes GG, which is the random phase approximation. It means that the polarization is made by the propagation of one electron defined by the first G times the propagation of one uh, pole, that is the second G. And there is no interaction between them. That would be the role played by this vertex. In the GW approximation, first approximation, we neglect this uh, interaction. So we neglect this vertex, this would be exact. And we set equal uh, this vertex equal to one. So P is just GG, 
And this is the random phase approximation. The second vertex was here. In principle, this expression is exact. GW gamma is the exact expression for the self energy. And instead, we neglect all these uh, effects that are beyond this uh, variation of the art interaction. And indeed, if you see here, the, in this term, there is the variation of the self energy, which is the exchange of correlation effects in this mini body picture with respect to the Green's function. And when we set gamma equal to one, we neglect this variation of the exchange correlation uh, potential, that is the self energy in this uh, expression here. And we put indeed the self energy equal to GW, okay? Okay, this is just schematic and uh, you don't need to know the, the these equations are just a, a reference because people very often uh, use them uh, because they are an ele uh, elegant manner to summarize all the physical processes that are taking place in, in the body picture, okay? In the GW approximation, we don't need them because we just stop at the level of the um, vertex equal to one, the simplest uh, possible approximation. In principle, and that's why you have this uh, pentagon, we could iterate uh, all these equations in a self-consistent manner, in the sense that you start from an approximation to the self-energy, even self-energy equal to zero. You set this uh, approximation in this dozen equation, you calculate G, from G you calculate the vertex, from the vertex you calculate P, from the polarization you calculate the, the screen, uh, Coulomb interaction, and then you iterate. In principle, you could solve these equations in this way. And if you do so, you may hope to get to the exact uh, Green's function. In practice, in the GW approximation, we don't do so, we just stop at the first iteration, which means we just set the vertex equal to one and we get these uh, four equations, okay? Okay, I have just uh, five minutes and in these five minutes, I would like to compare the Artifoc approximation with GW approximation. And you see that the only difference between GW and Artifoc is the, is in the expression of the self energy is the fact that we have replaced the bare Coulomb interaction V with the screen Coulomb interaction W. So GW, after all, after two days of discussion can be simply summarized as screen Artifoc approximation. Okay. So if someone asks you, asks you what is GW, you can immediately answer, well, it's artery fog with screening, nothing else, nothing more. But this is important because if you do artery fog in a solid, this is not good. And you have seen this uh, on Monday. Why it's not good? Because you are not taking into account the screening and the screening is very important in solids. And it's the physical process that is uh, at the heart of the difference between the bare Coulomb interaction and the screen Coulomb interaction. That's why W is frequency dependent, and that's why then the self energy is frequency dependent. Hartree Fock, you have potentials that are still static, they are no local, but static. In GW, the self energy becomes frequency dependent. It also becomes a complex potential. And that's why you have an imaginary part of the quasi-particle excitation that is associated to the lifetime. In r fock the lifetime is infinite and indeed the self energy is real, okay? And since the self energy is complex and uh, frequency dependent, instead of having a simple delta peak, the consequence of being complex and frequency dependent is that the spectral function as this uh, more uh, complicated and I would say just richer form because we are taking into account 
more physics than just the artery fog. And this uh, uh, screening is the first ingredient of correlation that we take into account beyond artery fog. And it turns out that it's very often in uh, many material, the most important effect. It's not always the case, but very often, very often, if you deal with extended materials in particular, where you have many electrons that can react, screening is very important. So if you don't take into account the screening, it's likely that you are not going to take to describe well the material of interest. Possibly it's not the only correlation effect that you have to take into account, but very often it's very important. And in the, maybe I just conclude with this, in the GW approximation, the screening is described in terms of the coupling between the additional uh, hole or the additional electron in the system and the neutral excitations that are associated to charge excitations. So GW, is a way to describe the coupling between electrons and neutral charge excitations. We don't take into account, for example, the coupling of electrons with spin excitations, like magnums. The screening due to spin excitations here is beyond GW. So if this process is important in uh, your material, GW is not a good approximation. Okay, it's not enough. And this is encoded in the expression of the self energy that you will calculate in GW. And you see that uh, the self energy has uh, holes at the energies that are the quasi particle energies, that are these additional removal energies EI, and the neutral excitations omega s, that are those that are the uh, holes of the skin curve interaction that are the peaks of the loss function. For example, plasmids. And this is indeed the pictorial representation of the GW approximation. You create a positive uh, charge in the material because you have added uh, uh, a charge in, in your material. It's like letting a drop uh, uh, going on the surface of uh, water. And this drop is uh, inducing a reaction of all the other drops of water that you have. And you see them in the form of waves, or in our case of oscillation of charge that are plasmids or neutral uh, electronal uh, excitations. This is in essence what GW is. And in terms of mathematics, this is the expression G times W. That's all so far. Uh, after no, after me, so immediately in now, uh, mm -hmm. Matteo Giantumas is going to tell you how to do GW calculations in practice. Okay. So this was. Uh, just meant to illustrate the physical concept uh, of many body perturbation theory and the GW approximation in particular. Now you will move to serious things, okay? How to do GW calculations in practice. And you will see more in details all the equations that are related to GW approximation, okay? So if you have questions about the physics, we can maybe still five minutes from Matteo. If not, um, if you want to know more details about the implementation and the equations that you will have to solve, then we move immediately to, to the continuation of this discussion. So do you have any questions, comments, complaints? Uh, I don't know. I have a quick question about the edit situation. Are they etched or is there some intrinsic approximation in the, in the okay? Equation? This in principle is a, an exact set of five, five equations for these five unknowns. So if you are interested in calculating the Green's function, as we are, 
in principle, if you solve these equations, you get uh, the solution. Okay. In reality, you have to be very careful because you see that, okay, you don't see clearly because this, this is just a schematic representation, but you can imagine that this is a nonlinear set of integral differential equations, which means that you don't get only the exact solution, you can get actually an infinite number of solutions. So you have to be very careful about the solution that you get by this iteration. It's not obvious that if you are able to solve these equations, you get to the exact many body Green's function. You can get to another Green's function that is not the exact solution, okay? And um, this is always the case when you have no linear equations, okay? It's also the case when you do Consham DFT, you can get to a solution that is not the ground state solution. And it happens already at the artifact level. Again, it's a nonlinear equation because it's a self-consistent equation. Besides this, okay. Uh, sorry, I just took over because you were talking about that and I wanted to, to put the, uh, uh -huh. the integral differential equation, but I, you were faster. Uh, but besides this, in principle, this is exact if you want to calculate G. And uh, Francesco, tomorrow we talk about the beta subbeta equation that is actually related to the solution of this vertex equation. So. Okay, yeah. There was a question from the audience if you just can, can uh, spend a few words on the RPA. Where I am now? You have just to. to, to to screen, uh, share screen again. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Well, I'm not able. So what's, what's, what, what is the question about the RPA? I don't know if Masoud, you want to unmute yourself? Hello. Do you hear me? Yes. Sort Thank of. you very much for your presentation. First, uh, actually, the, about RPA, I've already as I have something and always in a workshop, I've heard about it, but uh, I haven't such a, a clear understanding of that. Always we say that it's a kind of bubble approximation. Consider different bubbles and kind of. Uh, Part three time dependent uh, approximation, uh, but uh, I haven't a very clear uh, physical meaning of that. Uh, this is why that I ask if you have something more clear and can help me. I would be appreciated. So, yeah, the, um, I would say that the simplest way to understand the random phase approximation in our context is to think about the Dyson equation for the response function in TDFT. Okay, where you have a kernel uh, that is the sum of the Coulomb interaction plus FXC. And the random phase approximation corresponds to setting FXC equal to zero. Why is it so? Because the random phase approximation is just considering the variation of the RT potential with respect to uh, an external uh, perturbation. So the random phase approximation corresponds to, is equivalent to, the time dependent, time dependent R3 approximation. Okay, physically, it means that we are taking into account the propagation of one electron and one hole, but this electron hole uh, pair is non interacting. So the polarization is not zero, the screening is not zero, but we are neglecting the excitonic effects, the interaction between the electron and the hole. The physical content of this is that we are taking into account what we uh, would identify as dipole dipole interactions that are at the origin of, for example, collective uh, phenomena like the plasmon excitations. Is that enough or you want to know more? 
Uh, okay, uh, as far as I understood, actually, you described uh, the product of uh, G naught and G naught, just propagation of electron and hole separately without uh, any internal interaction, right? Yes, without the electronal interaction, yes. Okay, uh, and what does it mean that uh, sometimes it is referred as a bubble, bubbles approximation, something like this, that uh, there are some uh, bubbles in Feynman diagram? Yes, it's because this is the representation in terms of Feynman diagrams. And uh, each propagation of a particle that is a Green's function is generally represented by a, an arrow in, uh, in, in uh, Feynman diagrams. Now, I don't know if you see the, the white board. Maybe not. Afraid not. Uh, with a different color, maybe. Otherwise, you have it there, the P equal G, G gamma. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's visible. Okay. So this would be 1G, and this would be 1G. So this is a ring or a bubble. And this is P. P equal I G G. And I don't know if you see the arrows, but one goes in this direction and the other goes in this other direction because one describes the propagation of one electron and the other is describing the propagation of one point. Okay. So if you like, this is an approximation for the polarization P that is the product of two Green's function. And we neglect the interaction between the electron and the hole. And this would be the vertex that we neglect. We set it equal to one. Then P is inserted in an expression for the uh, response function chi. And again, I hope you can see it. Okay, do you see this? Uh, unfortunately not, but I can imagine so what you are saying. I is equal to P plus P B chi. Okay. Then P is a bubble, as you say which is one electron, one hole. And this is, ah, okay. is just, you can consider this as a creation of a dipole because you have created a positive and a negative charge. It's a dipole. And then through this Coulomb interaction, all these dipoles are interacting. And in the response function chi that you, I have not calculated because you, are, you were not in the end zone, but that you can calculate. You can see the effect of all these uh, interactions in between the dipoles in the response function. And you can measure the response function doing elastic ray scattering or electron energy loss spectroscopy. And you can see this in the forms of peaks. And for example, you can see this as a plasmon excitations. Okay. You neglect all the variation of the exchange correlation potentials you, that are uh, beyond the variation of the R3 potential. So all these effects are beyond the time dependent R3 approximation that is the random phase approximation. I hope it's okay, even though. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Follow from there. Okay. I have here a short question. Um, after this lecture, I think that the most, I would say the most straightforward way to um, describe the GW approximation is that you send the static screenings because you don't consider the variation of the screening. Um, however, I want it's to a screen artifact approximation. Yeah, a dynamical screen artifact approximation. Yeah. Okay. What I'm wondering is if from Hayes equations, has or is it there some trying of doing other kind of approximations among heading that is not only gamma equal one, maybe okay, the, gamma two equals to B or in, in, in this is not the only way you can write down these uh, 
equations for many body perturbation theory. And the fact that you have this W, it's because you want to put forward these uh, effects related to the screening due to the charge. Okay, so Edin had already in mind this idea that the screening due to the charge excitations is very important. And all the other effects are corrections that are encoded in the uh, vertex. But you can also think that other interactions are important. And then you have to go back here. And you can assume that instead of coupling one hole with the electron hole pair, you can take uh, other kind of uh, interactions as the most important in your uh, system. For example, you can couple the photo hole with another hole. Or you can uh, think that the screening due to spin excitations, as I mentioned, it is important. And um, this, for instance, is possible. And for example, it's done in the T matrix approximation. So in the T matrix approximation, the self energy is not G times W, it's G times T, the T matrix. I don't have time to discuss about the details of the T matrix, but physically, the T matrix is taking into account other interactions that are uh, different with respect to what we have discussed and are uh, continuing the GW approximation. In the Edin equations, in the Edin equations, this would be in the uh, uh, vertex. So everything that is beyond GW is trivially in the vertex. But this is just because we have made the choice saying that the screening of the Coulomb interaction is the most important physical aspect that we want to take into account. We could write different Edin equations where we separate the pieces differently. This is just one choice. Fine. You are still alive. Okay, then I think we have to move on to, to Matteo, the other Matteo. 